Hello everyone, and welcome back to the series in which I build a CPU and scrap mechanic. In the last video, I covered the basics of logic gates and scrap mechanic, and some basic circuits in the game. But today, in episode 2, we're going to discuss the basics of RAM, or random access memory. So what is RAM? RAM stands for random access memory, and it's basically where your computer stores information it's currently working on. And depending on how old your computer is, it could also include the code it's using. Now since this is scrap mechanic, you won't be having even a kilobyte of RAM without it lagging out your computer. So usually, the RAM models I use are usually only tens of bytes in size. The random access part of the name means that you can pull data from any random address without it interfering with the other data, unlike other storage methods that need to be read in sequential order. So today we're going to build a 16 byte 8 bit RAM, which means we can store 16 different chunks of 8 bit data. Now, why would I build my own RAM? You could be asking. There are a lot of RAM blueprints already on the Steam Workshop, but building a RAM is a good learning experience. Also, Making your RAM work with your CPU is easier for your design because you know how it works for troubleshooting it. So the connection between the CPU and RAM is as follows. There are address pins, the data in pins, the data out pins, and finally, the read write pin. Now on a real CPU, these pins would be metal and not connections like they are here in Scrap Mechanic. So on modern RAM, the data in and out pins can be the same pins. Just information goes one way or another depending on if it's reading or writing. But in Scrap Mechanic, they are separate. So these, so these ones give data to write to the RAM, and these ones are what send data out when you read the data. So here are the four address pins, which transmit the address to read or write from. There are four to transmit the binary number 0 through 15, which is what 4 bits allow. So basically, this is for a 16 byte mo module. And finally, this one is what tells the RAM whether to read or write from the targeted address. If this one is on, it is writing. If it is off, it's reading. The reason I call these pins is that there would be one set of this on the RAM and one set on the CPU itself. And you bridge the connections together, basically plugging the RAM into the CPU. So it's like pins on a connector. These are all the pins that are required for a CPU to communicate with the RAM. Now this will only work for a 8 byte system, as you can see by the 8 byte chunks. Now the only quirk of this system is that if none of the pins are powered, it is telling it to read from byte 0. Now that's not a problem, as you can add delay using a timer, telling it how long to wait to read from another byte because it's scrap mechanic and there's delay but that's just a quirk of it being a scrap mechanic in real life they're nearly instant and you don't need to add any delay or anything but because it's always telling it to read from byte zero you just gotta wait for the output of data to be there to accept it in So for this RAM, the four address pins, or however many pins you want for your RAM, go into a binary decoder. If you don't know what that is, check out the previous video. Now I have already spawned this in, but all you need to do is connect it directly into the input of the binary decoder. So now, whatever binary number is being inputted 
with these four pins would be turned into 16 different outputs, 0 through 15, each having its own logic gate. Now, if you recall what I said a second ago, you can clearly see that no inputs are currently active. But, because of that, the number 0 is being inputted, and it is saying that byte 0 is currently being activated. So here is one byte. If you don't know what that is, you should watch a previous video. This would be at address 1. Now there are two inputs and one output to this. So the data input must be connected to each byte, just like this. And next, this AND gate here must be connected to the output for the binary decoder for this address, which is 1. And as you can see, 0 is currently being entered. 0 is lit up, so next to that would be 1. This has to be connected to the gray one, as well as the read-write pin. So that this only writes the data when both the read-write pin is activated and the correct address is entered. On this side, these will be connected to the data out pins when you reach this address. But to do so, the gray pin connected to these logic gates, this one, must be connected to the output from the binary decoder, just like the other gray logic gate. And now, these eight have to be connected to the output. I've just finished connecting everything up. The data pins go to the data in, the read-write pin goes to this gray one, along with the output from the binary decoder. And the binary from the output from the binary decoder also goes to the confirm the output. And the output goes to the output pins for the data return lines. Now, it would repeat the same process for every single other address of RAM you have. But since this is scrap mechanic and logic gates aren't near instant like they are in real life, there's one weird thing about address zero. If you notice, the binary decoder is always outputting zero, which is a little bit of a problem. For writing to the RAM, the actual write signal from the read-write pin gets there for long enough that no matter what address you enter, there's always one tick for the game to think that it should write to address zero. So my, fi my fix for this is to put a timer on a three tick delay in the zero output on the binary decoder, this one, and write it into the logic gate that goes from the right pin, you know, this gray one. Now, this is only a scrap mechanic issue, and actual logic gates are nearly instant. This is not an issue on real computers. Here is my 16-bit, 8-byte RAM. Now, as you can see, it looks a lot like that one that we were just working on. But there's eight of them, and oh no, it gets complicated. You get used to it, it gets a lot more complicated than this. But what I pulled this up to show you guys is that this here is byte zero, and the output from byte zero goes into this AND gate here, along with the read write toggle, into this three tick delay timer, and then into this gray one for ticket from writing. This is the actual application of what I was just talking about. Without it, it would always try to write to byte zero, like I said earlier. Now that we have it working, we can pick it up and place it back down. And oh no, we can see another scrap mechanic based issue. Now, how do I solve this? I saw this with something called a black circuit. And I don't know why I called it that. It's probably because I painted it black originally. Here it is. What this does is when a creation is placed down, as you just saw there, it will send out a pulse that resets all flashing logic gates. This, of course, is connected to the black input on all logic bits. Now that I have it welded down, I can show you how to connect it up. You see, you take the white output to the black input, which connects to the, the reset signal on every logic bit in this series. So. When we place it down, after a second or two, it resets it, and it's ready for use.
now that this is completed, we can put the address on the address pin, the data on the data pin, and if we want to write a read. But first, since this is address 1, let's say we want to write to address 0. And look, we, no data is being written here. But when we tell it to write to address 1, which is that one, and we send the signal, there's the data. Now, let's take a look at my RAM. Here is the 16 address RAM I use. This is actually the first complex logic creation I ever built. It's pretty old, and this is only actually version 3, the third modification I ever made to it. Now, take a look at this. Here's the RAM I use for 16 bit computers. You might look at it and say, but isn't that just two 8 bit RAMs strapped together? Well, then I would correct you. These are welded together. I'm showing you guys this so that you can see how to creatively solve problems like this. A while ago, I needed a RAM module that stores information in 16 byte chunks, as you can tell, by the 16 bit data in and data out chunks. Yes, in theory, it could store more than just 16. But I thought about it and realized I don't really want to build a new RAM because it's already pretty complicated. So what I did was I put two RAMs together, duplicated the address and read pins to the upper half and the lower half, as you can see here, and I split the data in and out so that each half only got one half, and this works perfectly. Today I will show you guys two more things to scrap the camera, that being the one tick pulse generator and the pulse extender. So the one tick machine is as follows, you take a button or any other input and then you have a NOR gate and an AND gate, turn this into a NOR, and then you connect them like so. The button goes to both of them and the NOR goes into the AND gate. What you get is a one tick pulse out of the AND gate. Now this is not how it would actually work in real life, it would not be useful. But it's very useful for scrap kit creations because no matter how long you press this button, you get a one tick pulse out. There are two types of pulse extenders in scrap kit. Here is the first type. From the input, your button, you connect it to a line of AND gates. Let's take four as an example. And at the end, you have an OR gate, which is connected to all the other AND gates in a line. And this will extend your input and pulse length, or how long you press the button by, by how many logic gates are in this line, one tick per each. Now, I'll connect that up, and you gotta connect every AND gate to the OR gate. And if you look at the AND gate, uh, sorry, the OR gate on the end, you see it's the length that's longer than I pressed the button for. Now, this is great if you know exactly how long of a pulse you need. However, I found a pulse extender that allows you to change how long of a pulse from a timer, which is really useful. And this creation right here is what I call the Buttons Made Good Machine. The reason why I call it this is that if you connect the buttons to the green inputs like this, the red output will always be the same pulse length, no matter how long you actually press the button. This is great for creations that are very reliant on the pulse length and have buttons as inputs. And you use this so you don't mess up your circuitry. What it actually does is the green inputs are a one tick pulse generator like I built earlier. The rest of it is the other pulse extender I want to show you guys. Now, a great thing about this circuit is that I is that you can change how long the output is this through this timer. So if you're troubleshooting your creation, you can just tweak how long the timer delay is tick by tick until your creation works. And believe me, there's a lot of troubleshooting to do. Now I know for a fact that I did not design the actual pulse extender, but if I find the original blueprint on the workshop, I'll put it on screen here. 
Now, how does this black circuit from earlier actually work? You might be wondering. Well, it all starts with the sensor looking at the ground, and you also need a timer. And what you need to do is face a timer looking downward at the floor, and then have a timer with a two, I don't know, maybe three second delay on it. And then out of that, you take the timer goes into the one tick pulse and the sensor goes into the timer now out of here you take this into a four tick pulse extender out of the output of that just like this and, and now whenever you place it down it functions just like the black circuit. Now, you can build your very own for your own RAM or other logic-based creation. I hope you enjoyed watching today's video. We've been working on this one for a while. Stay tuned for the next video where I discuss the actual CPU parts and a few more essential things needed for an actual working processor, as well as any other important terminology. If you watch this far somehow, I don't know how, and if you're wondering what all this stuff is, I'd highly suggest watching the previous video linked in the iCard in the top corner. If you have any questions or suggestions, leave them in the comment section. I'll try to reply quickly. Thanks for watching.